How do we live fruitful lives? How, we, how do we live really, really, really fruitful lives? Because I know you want to make a difference, and I know you don't want to waste your life. So how do we become the kind of people who, who bear fruit 30, 60, and 100-fold? This is a relevant conversation for all of us. It's a relevant conversation for Real Life Church. I'm thrilled about the 30 by 30 vision. What an awesome, awesome vision to go after planting 30 churches in the state of California. But I know it's going to take not only you living an incredibly fruitful life, but us as the people of God in California living a very fruitful life where we give our lives away. I've been so impressed with Pastor Rusty and his humility, his willingness to learn and grow and not coast, not settle, but press in. This, this is what it's going to take. As we think about living, of that, living towards that 30-30 vision, as you contemplate your commitments, your decisions to, to give and be generous, we're going to look at a passage of scripture that was Jesus' first parable and effect, actually his key to all the parables. Jesus says, if you don't get this parable, you're not, you're not going to get anything else. But this parable is the key to what it looks like to live a 30-fold life and to be a 30, 60, 100-fold church. If you have your Bible, would you open to Mark chapter 4 or your phone or your iPad or some of you just have this memorized so you can just turn in your memory bank to Mark chapter 4. I'm going to read beginning in verse 1, uh, the first 20 verses of Mark chapter 4. Again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. As he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, listen. Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked it out, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about these parables, and he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Here's his explanation. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear, 30, bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Jesus' parable of the soils It's amazing to me that we can even read the words that Jesus spoke 2,000 years ago and continue to learn from them. They're as relevant as ever. Jesus talks about four kinds of soils. The same seed goes into four kinds of soils. 75% of that seed didn't produce any lasting fruit. But the 25% that did was extremely abundantly, lavishly fruitful. I want to be a 30, 60, 100-fold guy. I think you want to be a 30, 60, 100-fold person. And we as a church, as the body of Christ here in California, want to bear fruit 30, 60, and 100-fold. 
There's opportunities for us to receive the seed and not bear fruit. The craziest truth about this passage to me is that the word of God, the seed that he talks about, can actually be choked out. If I was writing this parable or I was writing this story, I'd say, no way, impossible. There's no way that the word of God, the most powerful force in the universe by which God spoke the world into existence and by which we are saved, the word of God could be choked out. No way. I wouldn't believe it except for the fact that Jesus said it. He said that his word can actually be choked out. And he says it can be choked out by three very specific things. He didn't say, oh, the million ideologies and religions and philosophies and temptations of the world are just going to squeeze in and choke the word. He says there's three things that will choke out your life from bearing the kind of fruit that God intends for you. There's three things that will choke out this church from being a 30, 60, and 100-fold church. Now, if you said there's three things, I'd want to know. You want to know? Let's look at it again. In Mark chapter 4, verse 19, here's what Jesus says. The cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word so that it proves unfruitful. As a friend of mine, I was talking with him about this passage, and he said, do you know that two and a half of the three things Jesus says will choke out your life are financial? I said, what? He said, yeah, two and a half of the three things. It's pretty simple. He said, cares of the world. What do people care about? <laughs> Money. Money, more money, and what it will do for them. So he said, check. Deceitfulness of riches, check. And desires for other things. What do most people desire? More and more and more. He's like, we'll give that one a half. Two and a half of the three things that will choke out your life and this church from maximum fruitfulness are financial. Jesus doesn't list all the possible options and temptations. He says two and a half of the three things that you need to watch out for that are seeking to have a chokehold on your life and on your potential fruitfulness are financial. But the, the other side of that is the fourth kind of soil. When that chokehold is broken, what the word of God does, it's so powerful. This seed bears fruit. It enters into our hearts and our minds and we begin to live it out and see God producing a kind of multiplication in our lives that we could never do on our own. That's what seeds do. You could take one, you could take one seed from an, orange, from an orange, plant an orange tree, and that orange tree could be bearing fruit for generations. This is how God intended our lives to be. That we wouldn't just receive this good news that we call the gospel and this amazing truth about a God who loved us enough to send his son Jesus into the world to save us. But the, and, then, and then hit pause until we get to heaven. But between the moment that you become a Christian and the moment that God calls you home to be with him face to face forever, your life would be abounding with fruit. Man, I want that for my life. And what I love about this 30 by 30 vision is we're not saying we just want to be a church for us. We want to bless other churches, other pastors, other places, other cities that we've never been or we might not go, but we want to contribute to the work of God in those people and in those places. I want to help you do that. So what does it take to break this chokehold? Well, you know, Phil Knight is... Uh, the creator of Nike. He's the guy who's the entrepreneur behind creating Nike. And you have a pair of Nike shoes at home, I get it. And she, Phil Knight wrote a, wrote a memoir about starting the company and he called it Shoe Dog. I'm not endorsing the book, but I will say at the very end of the book, there's something very, very fascinating. He talks about this long struggle to build this unique company and in the end, uh, the, the payday hit and he and his wife and his team and all the executives uh, made a lot, a lot of money. But then he says this, let me read this quote to you from Phil Knight. When it came rolling in, the money affected us all. But that's the nature of money. Whether you want it or not, whether you have it or not, it will try to define your days. Our task as human beings is not to let it. Phil Knight would not claim to be a follower of Jesus, would not claim to be a Christian, and yet he's saying, when all of this wealth came rolling in, my temptation was for it to define me, for it to choke out my life. 
the nature of why this struggle with either fruitfulness or being choked out is so difficult is this is the story way back to the very beginning when God created the world. His first commandment to Adam and Eve was be fruitful and multiply. He didn't say, I set you guys up with a beautiful world. You're enjoying all these incredible fruit trees. You have an awesome relationship with the animals. You have a perfect marriage and you walk and talk with me every evening in the cool of the garden. You're good. Just, just settle in, just enjoy. His command to them was be fruitful and multiply. God's made us to be people of multiplication. And yet there's an enemy. From the very beginning, an enemy, the serpent, entered the garden and his first lie was to tempt Eve by saying, you're not gonna die. No, if you disobey God's word and go against his command, he knows that your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. God's holding out on you. You can't really trust him. He doesn't really want your best. He's cheap. He's miserly. God is not generous. It's the first lie that entered the world. He, he tempted Eve with a piece of fruit. Now, fruit is really, really good. <laughs> I love fruit. I love all kinds of fruit. And yet he held out this piece of fruit for Eve or seems to draw her attention to it and then attach a bunch of lies to this thing. The nature of our temptation is not that we're going to walk away from following Jesus and most likely pursue some other religion or ideology. If you've tasted God's goodness in your life and you know his love for you and you've seen what a great and awesome God he is, the, the likelihood of you walking away from that is not very high, but the likelihood of you getting distracted and choked out by created things is still there. We don't generally substitute worshiping the creator God for another God. We generally, in our culture, we're tempted to worship created things rather than the creator God. We're tempted to exchange the things that God has made and worship the gifts instead of the giver. We're, we're, we're believing a lie that if, if we can get our, our, our hands on what, what this created thing is, whatever it is, you fill in the blank. If only I had blank, then my life would be better. If only I drove blank, my life would be good. If, if only I could own blank, then life would just, I, I will have had it made. This is the lie and the temptation that our enemy has been telling us from the very beginning that created things can define us, satisfy us, complete us, and fulfill us. And it's not that, it's not the way. It's not God's way. You know, recently my children and I were walking through an airport in Atlanta and there was a, a banner up top, an advertisement, and it said, you are what you fly, Delta Airlines. <laughs> Wait a second, my identity is wrapped up in which airline I choose to fly on? <laughs> my life and well-being is going to be hanging in the balance on that decision? I don't think so. Sorry, Delta. The biggest airline in the country, I don't think so. But you can substitute, you are what you drive, you are what you wear, you are what neighborhood you fit into or what friend group you have or what community you get to be a part of as if created things get to define us. That's what Phil Knight is talking about. Our task as human beings is not to let it. And from Jesus' words, it's, it's these things that enter in and choke out the word of God so that we don't live the fruitful lives we're intended to live. You're not what you drive. You're not what you fly. You are who God says you are. You're a son of God, a daughter of God, a child of the living God, born again, set in heaven. Your name is written in the, in the Lamb's book of life. You have a future. You have a hope. You have a purpose. You have a destiny that God has assigned over your life. And he doesn't want you to miss it. He doesn't want you to be choked out. But the enemy will lie about created things and say, if you hang on to these things, that's where life is truly found. There's a famous story in the book of Luke where Jesus is talking to some Pharisees and he tells the story of a rich man who, whose field was just booming. He had a bumper crop. And so he said, I don't know what to do with all this surplus. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns so I can store up all of my grain so right now I can eat and drink and be merry and just relax. And Jesus said, you fool. And yet, I think that's what he would say to so much of our culture in America. You fool. 
Your goal is to eat and drink and relax and be merry, but I've made you for a mission. I've called you for a purpose. I've put you on planet Earth for a destiny and for good works, which I intend for you to fulfill. But we get choked out even by our abundance. And I know some of you are sitting here going, wait, but I don't have a lot of money. Is he talking to me? This is for all of us, no matter if you have a little or you have more than you ever dreamed of. The temptation for us to be choked out is the same. The rich and the poor can equally love money. What do you mean by that? The poor can love money thinking, if only I could get it, then I could make it. And the rich love money thinking, now I got it, I can't lose it. <laughs> this defines me, so I can, I can never go backwards. I have to go forwards. You know, there's only one thing that God said, you cannot love God and money. Jesus could have plugged in a lot of different things in there. You cannot love God and sin. You cannot love God more than your family. You cannot love God and immorality. He said, you, you cannot love God and money. Jesus also said something really interesting. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I know some of you guys like to play fantasy football. Some of you put a few dollars on March Madness basketball games. And whenever you get financially involved in something, you care a whole lot more. You know what I'm talking about? You put a little money on a basketball game for March Madness or an office pool of who's, who you think is going to win a tournament. And all of a sudden, you start to care more. Or if you get a gift for someone, you start to care about that person a lot more. Our hearts have this really interesting intertwined relationship with money. We have a spiritual relationship with money. And it, I used to think that God and money were two totally separate subjects and they never actually you know, overlapped at all. But we find in the, in the scriptures that Jesus talked about money and stewardship and possessions about 25% of the time. More than heaven and hell combined. Why? Because Jesus loved money and was trying to get a bunch of money for himself? No. He knows how our hearts can get wrapped around money and he wants to set us free. He wants to set us free to follow God and free to live incredibly fruitful lives. So what does it take to break this chokehold of money not defining us? I'll tell you a little bit of my story. Testify for a few minutes if I, if I may. I grew up in a family that was kind of middle class, went to, I became a Christian when at the age of seven, studied business in college, got a job right out of college studying uh, in, in sales, and, um, but the whole time I was very cheap, very miserly, very stressed out by money. It felt like when I would make a decision, instead of asking, God, what do you want me to do? The first thing I would ask is, how much is it gonna cost? Money was in the driver's seat of, de of decisions. Do you, do you ever been there? Can you identify with someone invites you out to dinner or someone has an opportunity for you to be a part of? What's your first impulse? What's your first question? My, mine really was, how much is it gonna cost? Money was driving so many of the decisions of my life. And when I graduated from college, I had this mountain of student loans and student debt on my back. And I was the cheapest husband on planet Earth. I mean, my wife called me from Target one time asking if she could spend $3 to buy some sponges to clean the kitchen sink. And I said, we don't have $3. That belongs to Sally Mae. I'm sorry. We had no, almost no furniture of our own for the first year and a half of our marriage because I refused to buy it. I said, we don't have any money. It belongs to somebody else. And so we need to pay off this debt as soon as we possibly can. And they sent me a plan for 15 years to pay off debt. And I said, Renee, it's got to be faster than that. Let's keep going. So we started chunking away at our debt and God kept blessing us. And within 18 months, our debt was evaporated. God took care of it. He took care of it. And for me, that, that began to spark some questions that I didn't have answers for. Questions like, why am I working so hard? We were living in Orange County, California at the time, very near to Newport Beach, and it felt like the goal of life was to get a bigger and bigger house, closer and closer to the beach, and drive a faster and faster car. I was like, that's not a big enough dream. That's not why God put me on planet Earth. So what's the purpose of money? And how is it that business and professional people fit within the kingdom of God? I grew up in a family of business people and my wife's family were business people, but somehow there's a sneaking suspicion that aren't business and professional people, people that don't work for a church or a ministry or are missionaries, aren't, aren't we really just kind of second-class Christians? While those who preach and lead worship and teach, they're, they're really God's varsity team and the rest of us just clap and cheer and support them. 
I was wrestling with some pretty big questions and I couldn't find any answers despite going to a good church and having good people in my life. So I, 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 for six months, I wrestled and prayed about what my next step in business was. I was unmotivated just to keep working to make more and more money because I was asking the question, for what? For what? You know, over the years, I've talked to a lot of people who've made a lot of money. A friend of mine, his uncle, uh, was a surgeon and worked 40 years as a surgeon. He didn't know Jesus, was not a Christian. And at the end of 40 years, when he finished his practice, he said to my friend, I worked 40 years and I made a big pile of money and I have no idea what to do with it. No idea what to do with it. He was chasing created things rather than the creator. He was building his life around wealth and what he thought it could do for him and in the end, lacked purpose, lacked meaning. I was wrestling with this at 25 and so I left business. I went to seminary to be trained as a pastor I thought that's where you found real purpose because obviously those guys are on God's varsity team, so maybe that's what I ought to do. And I was finishing up my seminary degree when I asked my wife a question that changed the trajectory of our lives for the next decade. I didn't know that question was about to do that, but I said to her, Renee, we've been chasing my dreams for the last four years. What's your dream? And I'd ask you that tonight. What's your dream for your life? What's your dream five years from now, 10 years from now? What kind of fruitfulness would you love to see in your life? What kind of experiences do you want to have? What kind of relationships would you hope for? What kind of a walk with God would you like? And what kind of fruit would you just love to see God do in and through you? Because he desires to bear fruit through our lives. Well, my wife, out of her heart, spilled an answer that I don't think she had even fully prepared. But she said, ever since I was 13, I dreamed of traveling all the way around the world in a single shot in order to become a global Christian and learn to walk by faith. Now, she had grown up with missionary grandparents and missionary uncles and aunts and cousins who were in other parts of the world serving Jesus and telling the gospel to tribes and peoples and cities. And she knew that God was not just the God of America. He was the God of all nations, all tribes, all races, all peoples. And she said, I want to go see it for myself. And the second was she wanted to uh, learn to walk by faith. So much of the noise in our culture is to chase comfort and security, to be as comfortable as possible, to live by sight, not by faith. And that's not what my wife wanted. We were 29 years old. We had no kids, no mortgage. I said, let's do it. It's now or when we're 65. So we put all of our belongings in storage and we traveled around the world for four and a half months, 132 days to become global Christians and to learn to walk by faith. It was an incredible adventure that would take an entire sermon series to unpack to you. But on that trip, the whole time I was wrestling with, I'm trained as a business leader and I have this degree in ministry. I don't think those things overlap. And when this trip ends, God, what do you want to do with my life? Why have you made me? What am I here for? I was praying every day, just seeking God. What, what's that going to look like? And so for four and a half months, we're worshiping with local Christians everywhere we go, trying to meet missionaries, Christians who work in business and the professional spaces and worship with them in their own context, in their own culture and ask them what God was doing and just see what God was up to around the world. While we're in India, a friend of mine who is a missionary there said, you know, if you ever go to Sydney, Australia, I want to introduce you to a guy named Simon, and you should ask him about this uh, concept called gospel patrons. And I said, well, I don't know what that means, but we'll be in Sydney in two weeks. Maybe you could connect us. And he said, great. So a couple weeks later, there we were, the 31st floor of his office building, and this British businessman walks out, gray hair, silver suit, cool accent, says, let's go to coffee. Partway into his cup of coffee, I said, you know, I'm supposed to ask you about this idea called gospel patrons, but I don't even know what it is. And he said, he said, behind every great movement of God in history, there have been those who proclaim the word of God. And we tend to think of those people as lone rangers, as these heroes of history who preached sermons and translated Bibles and went into hard places and crossed cultures and learned languages. And, and those people are heroes, but they were never lone rangers. God was always raising up people to stand with them and support them and fuel what they did through generosity people we called gospel patrons. He told me three little stories, just the seeds of these little stories about how throughout history God had worked through unexpected people who were not pastors or missionaries. 
One of those stories was that 500 years ago, this book didn't exist. This is an English Bible. You probably know that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in Greek. And in the fourth century, the Bible got translated into Latin. And so for a thousand years, the Bible in Europe was in Latin. Can you imagine that? A thousand years. But you also know that throughout Europe, language was developing and people were speaking Spanish and French and Italian and German and Portuguese and this other language called English. Latin was not what they spoke at home or in business. That is just was the language of the church and everything spiritual was in another language. Picture if I came out to preach tonight and I had a Russian Bible and I preached in Russian. <laughs> Maybe two of you could understand what I'm saying. And most of you would go, well, I'll ask him later. I'll trust, take his word for it. But you couldn't look at it for yourself. That's what this was like in, the, in England in the 1500s. But along came a young man who wanted to translate God's word for the first time in history from the original manuscripts into English. He couldn't do it alone. And so God raised up a business leader who was a cloth merchant, shipping cloth all over Europe and North Africa, a guy who history is almost totally forgotten, who said to him, I've heard God's given you a job to do. It's time you live at my house. I'll provide for you. I'll protect you. Get to work. Bible translation was an illegal task in that day. And so William Tyndale, the Bible translator in his 20s, lived in the home of a businessman for six months, translating the New Testament for the very first time into English. When he was completed with that translation, uh, the businessman used his merchant ships and got him across to the European continent where printing was still relatively new technology. A year later, 3,000 copies of the English New Testament rolled off the presses in 1526 for the first time. Those 3,000 copies were contraband books. And so they put them in watertight boxes and would drop them in a barrel of oil or in a barrel of wine and smuggled them on these merchant ships back into London. You imagine the English Bible being sold on the black market? I heard you got a copy of Ephesians. Maybe, maybe I do, maybe I don't. How much is it worth to you? Four shillings, two pence, done. You can have it. I heard you got a whole New Testament, one of the 3,000. Did you know what it said? <laughs> our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents never had the opportunity to hear God speak in the language that they speak at home Ephesians 2, do you know what it says? It says, for by grace we have been saved. It's not our own doing. It's not under works of the law. It's the gift of God. We are right with God. We have peace with God. We're reconciled with God. We're saved by God as a gift, not as something we earned from him by our good works. Did you know what Jesus said in his famous Sermon on the Mount? I've never grasped it until now. It's in my own language. He said, let your good works shine. Let your light shine before men that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. He says, we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We're not meant to be hidden. We're meant to be like a lamp on a stand that shines for him. Did you know what he said? Have you read how the story ends in Revelation? God is on his throne being worshiped by myriads of myriads, angels of angels, thousands of thousands, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that we have a seat at that party with him by grace. When the people of England got God's word in their own language for the first time, their hearts just lit up and nothing would stop them. No book burning parties, no edicts from the king of England trying to get rid of this contraband book. No, they said, we, we have to have it at all costs. We must know God as he has revealed himself in his word. William Tyndale, the Bible translator, was arrested for his work doing this. And Humphrey Monmouth, his patron, was also arrested. Humphrey Monmouth was imprisoned in the Tower of London for a year. William Tyndale was imprisoned in a place, a place called Vilvord Prison for 450 days in isolation, in the dark, in the cold. 
Humphrey Monmouth, his patron, was eventually released. William Tyndale, after 450 days, was led out to a public square, passing through a crowd of people, backed up against a stake. Brushwood was packed around his legs. And right before the commissary gave the nod to the executioner to pull the noose tight around his neck, William Tyndale cried out, God, have mercy on my king. Open the king of England's eyes. Lord, open the king of England's eyes. The noose was pulled. He was strangled. The flame was lit. His body was burned at the age of 41 because he gave us the Bible in English. His patron died within a year And it was as if their mission had been completed, that God had raised them up for this great work. And when it was done, it was time for them to go home. Neither one of them got to see how God was gonna use their work. But together they gave their nation of six million English speakers God's word in their language. And now any English Bible you've ever read finds its headwaters in two men. One, a ministry guy named William Tyndale and the other a business guy named Humphrey Monmouth. This is how God always works. He raises up someone who's gonna proclaim the gospel and someone who's gonna be the patron of the gospel. Somebody's gonna speak and somebody's gonna send. Somebody's gonna go and somebody else is gonna give. But when they come together, God does explosive things. Throughout history, God has been raising up behind the scenes generous men and women to stand with those who preach and teach and take God's word into the darkest, hardest, most lost places. And when his body works together, when you and I live radically generous lives to fuel the word of God going to the ends of the earth, God breathes on it a blessing that's 30, 60, and 100 fold. Jesus had women who supported his ministry. Mary, Joanna, and Susanna are their names. We find this in Luke chapter eight. Three wealthy women who stood behind Jesus when he left being a carpenter. I don't know if you ever thought about how, the, how Jesus funded his three years of ministry. You've heard that Jesus was a carpenter, the son of a carpenter. And at the age of 30, he left that and for three years traveled preaching and teaching with his 12 disciples. How'd they pay for all that? These guys had to eat. Was it just miracles of multiplying fishes and loaves every day? Was it just pour out some more... Um, tap water and make the best wine in the Roman Empire and sell that and fund ministry? Did Jesus tell his disciples to go fishing and catch the coins in their mouth? One for Caesar and two for ministry? No, scripture tells us three women, Mary, Joanna, and Susanna, gave generously to provide for him out of their means. The apostle Paul had a gospel patron. We read about her in Romans 16, a woman named Phoebe, who Paul says, thank her. She's been a patron of many and of myself as well. When God wants to advance his kingdom, some are gonna go forward and speak and lead worship and plant churches across California and many are gonna give and go to work the next day and wake up again to make money, not just for their name and for their kingdom, but for the name of Jesus and his kingdom. This is the amazing opportunity that we have as a church at this moment in time in California. We've got a chance to make a difference, to make a real difference to be the kind of people who live 30, 60, 100-fold lives, to be the kind of people who aren't choked out but live radically, generously, free of the lie and the trap of living for created things, to say our our king is the creator of the heavens and the earth. When we give to him and we advance his mission, he's on the throne and he can take care of us. God is so good. He's not asking you to do anything that he hasn't done first. The main story of the Bible is that the God of heaven is the most generous being we could ever conceive of. The most famous verse in all the Bible is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God could have made another world. He could have made all the silver and gold. He could have made another universe or another galaxy, but he only had one son. And he did not hold him back from us. But in our desperation and sin and need, God gave us his one and only son.
This is the God of the Bible. And how much did Jesus give us? He gave us his body. He gave us his blood. He gave us his very last breath while he was praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God has a future and a hope for you and for this church. He's the most generous God we could ever conceive of. He has given us spiritual gifts. He's given us a kingdom to be a part of, a role within his plans in human history. And the invitation on the table as we guys, as we pray and consider what your role is going to be in 30 by 30 and in the life and growth of this church is not to live for yourself, not to live for created things, but to open your hands with the things that God has given, to bear the Father's resemblance and becoming the kind of church and the kind of people who bear 30, 60, and 100 fold because his generosity has sunk in deep. I love to pray, pray this over you as you head towards this final step of this three year commitment for the campaign. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are the most generous one, that you've given way more than we could have ever dreamed or even asked for. You love us. You love us with a lavish generosity that would forgive our sins and involve us in your kingdom. God, would you come and make us those kind of people too. Make us the kind of people who don't live for ourselves and don't chase after created things, but we live for God and others and lay our lives down like Jesus did. I pray that you'd lead us very specifically what we can give, what we can contribute to the vision of 30 more churches being started in California and blessing people that we've never yet met. Make us like you. Open our hands to receive your heart and open our hands to lay down our treasure to something that's truly worthy. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.